Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, and I'm coming to you from Accra. It is so hot. It's hot, guys. And so it's so interesting because I was having a dinner a while back, maybe about a month ago, with a friend and her aunt. And her aunt, you know, she'd been here, gone out the whole time. And she was like, no, the really hottest time in Accra is February. It's That's when it's the hottest. And I'm like, March, April is boiling. Easter is always boiling to me. She's like, no, that's the raining season. And I'm like, and so myself and her, her other niece were like, mm, I want my auntie. And I have to say, I have to say, guys, if you're planning on coming to Accra, in your spring, it will be a proper summer spring break because it is hot. It might rain, but it's hot, it's humid. I mean, I don't mind it, but I'm just saying it's hot. <laughs> I'm actually like, why I love all of that. I'm so profoundly jealous deep within my soul. Yesterday, I have a picture of it. There was snow on my patio and I was like, <gasps> I, I heard. I heard. In Northern California, I did not yeah. sign up for the shenanigans and I... <laughs> And my core of me would love to feel hot, hot. and humid. Like yeah. I would love to feel 104 degrees and not have to wear like a sweatshirt, a sweater, a jacket and carry an umbrella. Like that sounds... <laughs> okay. Yep. I'm not complaining. And I am beaming you heat rays right now. It's all for you right now. <laughs> Thank all you. right, folks. Thank so you. you heard a little bit from my guest. So I'll do a proper introduction because I think she, she, she does understand this, this, what I'm talking about because she's a fellow uh, country person. And so let's get into it. She's a serial cultural entrepreneur with over a decade of finance and business development experience at Fortune 500 companies such as T-Mobile, Microsoft, Shutterfly, and Amazon. One of her earliest ventures was Sista Cinema, which started in her living room and expanded to 20 cities across the U.S., and internationally with a social slash email reach of 10,000 points of contact and online presence with Indie Flicks within five years. She successfully exited Sister Cinema by selling it to community investors in 2015. So fast forward a little bit, she went on to officially launch Sister Sci-Fi in 2019 with a celebration of Jewel Gomez's 25th anniversary edition of The Gilda Stories. And I think we'll talk more about that in the conversation. So then between 2019 and 2020, Sister Sci-Fi sales increased tenfold through expanding physical book selection, launching private labeled shirts, sweatshirts, and bags, and offering audiobooks and eBooks. Sister Sci-Fi has been featured in the New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Book Riot, BuzzFeed, Venture Beat, and Facebook's Boost My Business. Sister Sci-Fi has also hosted author interviews with John Jennings and Kay Jemison, L. McKinney, Jewel Gomez, and Nisi Shaw, to name a few. Sister Sci-Fi has developed strong collaborations with major international publishers such as Hatchet slash Orbit, Akashic, Abrams, Macmillan, slash Tor.com, and Simon & Schuster. Isis Asari, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And thank you for reading that bio. I am so happy to be here. I'm like ecstatic. Yay. Good, good, good. I'm I'm loving looking at your, your collection, your library behind you. Folks, you just have to follow her on Instagram and on social. So you have a sense of this, this space that we're in. But let's get right into it. Let's get started. Where are you from? Where are you local? And what is your craft? Mm, so I was born in Harlem, New York. So I was born in Harlem Hospital on 135th. So I'm a very proud Harlemite. I'm the child of two Guinean parents. They are both from a small village in Keta, which is like right it's like the ocean is triple and gets us on it mm, <laughs> the yeah the yeah uh, our poor keta yeah <laughs> yeah so what what is the name what's the name of the village keta um yeah i mean like the, keta so they're there, in yeah. the small part of it okay got it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so yeah so but they actually met here in the u.s in new york had me a long time ago and yeah so i grew up in houston and i currently live in oakland california And what is my craft? My craft is celebrating Black creatives. Mm. So that is what I think my broader superpower is. 
And right now I run Sister Sci-Fi, which is the first Black-owned bookstore focused on science fiction and fantasy in the U.S. Mm, mm. So interesting. You, your, your craft is celebrating Black creatives. And so do you, are you a Black creative? Like how do you categorize your, your, uh, your energy? <laughs> I love creatives and I realize I'm not a creative. <laughs> but the idea of like looking at raw materials and making it into something beautiful is very scary to me. My, my creative outlet is like making candles. And, and it's like, I don't even do like the, the mold ones. It's like take pouring wax into a container, adding color and fragrance. Like I know what it's going to look like before I even start. And that's, that's my creative outlet. So no, but I have so much respect and like, I hold so much awe for the creative pro- process. It's almost like magic to me. I'm like, you had this idea and you like collaborated and you, you, you made something that's so magical to me. I'm more of a coordinator. Okay. I mean, I might argue that you actually are probably very creative. Like all business entrepreneurs have to be creative and problem solve, but I'll let you, I'll let you have that one. You know, your, your candles, let's say your candles are your, your most creative, crafty, like quote unquote crafty endeavor. Right. Okay. So you, Grew, born in Harlem, grew up in Houston, and then now you are a California lady. So tell us how you came to be living, working, and playing where you currently are. Why the where? Oh, I remember talking to somebody about this, and I need to, I say this often, so I need to start quoting her correctly. So she actually lives in Brooklyn. And I was like, oh, so what did you think about living in Oakland? And she was like, Oakland is a place where magic happens. And I was like, Yes. Oakland is not a perfect city. It is very culturally diverse. It's very politically intentional in terms of like identity, both in terms of gender and sexuality and relationship dynamics. There's so much room to like explore and acceptance of that. So I think Oakland is a city where lots of different parts of me can be held. The tech entrepreneurship can be held. The person who is very mission driven and socially conscious can be held. The woman who's super black can also be held. And that doesn't happen all the time in all cities. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's going to be part of me, but not the whole mm-hmm. collective of me. So that's why Oakland, it's the city where magic happens. Okay. And so Oakland is kind of a big city. So tell us about your Oakland. What is your Oakland neighborhood like? Yeah. So I, I live in downtown Oakland and a part of me is like the heart of Oakland. And I have to stop that. I live in downtown Oakland. Right. I don't know if it's the heart of Oakland. Oakland, Oakland is a big city. There are lots of like really amazing, beautiful neighborhoods. You have West Oakland, you have East Oakland, you have deep East Oakland. We have Oakland Hills, which is a whole nother vibe. We have North Oakland, again, a whole nother. But I live in downtown Oakland. It's like, <laughs> it's like urban light. Urban light. <laughs> urban light. <laughs> okay. There's some public transportation, but not a lot. There's some bars and restaurants, and the bars and restaurants are really good. There's some people, but not a lot. And so it's just enough to make me feel like I live in an urban center, but not so much that I feel overwhelmed. So it's, it's, and, and I'm a big city girl. Like, you know, I grew up in New York. I was like in New York. So I spent most of my life with this. I like highly concentrated urban centers. So it feels good, but it's enough for me to navigate and so forth. It's not like trying to walk through Times Square every day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So take us into, you're this, you know, adult, you live in Oakland. It's the magical city. So take us into how you came to be Sister Sci-Fi. And, and even before that, how did you, the, the Sister Cinema in your living room, how does that work? Explain to us, what was that first entrepreneurial endeavor like? How did you go about it? What was the epiphany that started it? What inspired you? Tell us about that. Yeah. So Sister Cinema, which I, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. So the person I was dating, their friend group used to hang out every Sunday. And so one Sunday um, I was like, oh, I can host y'all at my house. And part of hanging out on Sundays was like consuming some type of media. And so I think, I can't remember what show I put on. It was some show, I think it was Lovers and Friends, which was a YouTube show based out of Atlanta about a, a bunch of lesbians and all this kind of stuff. 
Right. And somebody was like, oh, my God, I didn't know that there were shows about us, us being at the time. I think we're all identifying as black lesbians. But now we, I think most of us would say black queer people. And I'm like, oh, my God, yes, there's so much. And when I, I was very enthusiastic about that, I didn't know how much this so much was. But I was like, there's a lot. <laughs> so that was that was the genesis was like we as at the time, Black lesbians and later became queer women of color. We're going to get together, create a space to celebrate filmmakers, creating images and cinemas focused around queer women of color, where we're not like broken and dejected and in the closet and all that kind of stuff. And really tease apart the themes in those movies and talk about it and build community. And so like, the first couple were in my room, <laughs> in my living room, which is fun. It definitely built community. And then it grew, like I worked with different film festivals. And so we partnered to show movies like Pariah, Beauty and Truth, which is the documentary about Alice Walker and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that was a lot. And then so like, I, I was like, what's the way to scale this? And it'd be scalable if I got movie screening rights for a film for a month and then had the permission to show it multiple cities and worked with people to do that. So it started in Seattle because I was living in Seattle at the time and then expanded to, I think the first city was Cleveland, then Chicago. We were in some place in North Carolina and then the international was Kingston, Jamaica. Mm, mm, okay. Okay. So it was, I see. So it was a targeted film festival type of, not festival, but to, yeah, like a film festival type of thing. It was targeted. Oh. Yeah. So I kind of like, when I was younger, I interned with this organization called Black Cinema Cafe, where they would show an independent Black film each month in a bar or restaurant or a cafe, and people would come and check it out. So I was like, yeah, it'll be like Black Cinema Cafe, just queer women of color focus. And so... Obviously, this was kind of like a side hustle for you and your 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 day job was something in tech. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. How did you kind of conceptualize it as a business model? Because you weren't doing it for free. I'm, I, you know, for it to be sold, you had to have had a business model around it. So how did how did that take shape? Yeah, 100% of the revenue was from ticket sales. So people bought tickets to the event. So it was like, Okay. So yeah. So it's low, low over, low overhead. Basically, you made the arrangements, the licensing. I mean, that costs something. I'm assuming, but yeah. But when it was just one city, like the break even was kind of high. But when it was like multiple cities, that helped mm, mm-hmm. because the licensing fees scaled. So that was really nice. And and then when we did streaming, then it was a, a percentage of then there was revenue from the streaming rights. When it was on IndieFlix. So, yeah. So, in the beginning, it was ticket sales. And then when we were streaming, it was that streaming revenue as well. Mm, mm. And that was an early, that was an early kind of streaming endeavor. Yes. Yes. So, it was different. It's like streaming then in 2015. It's very, like, that was almost 10 years ago. Very different. Like, now there's like um, so many options. It's like, we could have been on like Amazon or like Twitter. Like, but at that time, having content streaming was took a whole, wasn't as accessible. So mm-hmm. understood. So it sounds like, you know, empowering creatives is where you found a sweet spot. And media seems to be something that is core to a lot of where where your creative energies are are in this place. So tell us a little bit more about how you as a child of Ghanaian parents have kind of ventured into this this creative space, obviously you've had you know, day jobs, but tell us about how you chose your chosen career of study and then how you kind of moved into this other side of media and transitioned into that that dual dual existence. Yeah, I think that's a good question. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually like going back and like, what was the process? I remember being, I knew when I finished graduate school, the strategy was, to work with tech companies, see the implementation of the business strategies that I learned in business school, right? Understand best practices and apply them to something, entrepreneurship. And I thought it would be more closely to Sub-Saharan Africa, which I'm still trying to like figure out how to make that work, but yeah. And I think to date has been media because I'm always looking for something scalable, right? So I was at T-Mobile because at the time is what something scalable like wireless technology and telecommunications, right? 
But as I started my entrepreneurship journey, I was like, it has to be scalable and also not require a lot of capital. Like wireless, wireless communications or radio requires like a, a large investment, which when I was as a solo entrepreneur, I, I don't have access to like millions or billions of dollars to buy like wireless. So yeah, so I think I was looking for something like event driven. I, I think, no, looking back, I literally Googled it. But it's the type of business that you could start without a lot of capital. And Google was like events. And I was like, okay, I'll, st- I'll start doing events. <laughs> this is why like Sister Cinema started off as events. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't need a lot of capital to start events. And so, yeah. And, and then the rest was kind of falling. What excited me when I communicated to people, what excited them. So, yeah. And then just taking, like building on the, the skills. Right. So with Sister Cinema, it was like that was the community that I was in. And then there was an opportunity to scale it by being in multiple cities. I didn't think about how niche. I mean, I had an awareness, but it is hyper niche, right? It's not only like Black people, it's Black women. It's not only Black women or women of color. It's like queer women of color. So like I took, I'm like, whoa. So yeah. <laughs> So when people are like, oh yeah, sister sci-fi is so niche, I was like, no, let me tell you about niche. Uh. <laughs> but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about developing partnerships, communicating value both ways, as opposed to like, you can come do this for me, communicating a brand, communicating attention, making that relevant for people, and communicating authentically to a particular community while also making it accessible for people beyond that intended audience. And, and the key thing is remaining authentic. I'm not trying to be BT 2.0. Not, not that I have anything against BT, but so yeah, so that's how Sister Cinema started. That is why it looks a lot like media a lot of the time. And with Sister Sci-Fi, it was really like, what am I passionate about? And then kind of testing that, like when I tell people like, oh, like I run a bookstore focused on like, indigenous and Black speculative fiction by Black and Indigenous authors, what's the level of excitement? And like for people who like science fiction, it's like, oh my God, I've been looking for you all my life. And for people who like don't read or don't like science fiction, it's still like, oh, that's a fascinating idea. Like send me the website because I probably know somebody who is. And so that's really been cool. And I think social media allows me as an entrepreneurship to test ideas and get reactions a whole lot faster. It's definitely like um, an echo chamber, but at least I can say like, I had this idea. I'm thinking about selling this book. Two people liked it or 2,000 people liked it, right? Like, so I get a sense of what's the interest and where to do and where to put my energy, which is good. So yeah, I'll play into that question. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and so when did you fall in love with science fiction? Because you said it's your passion. So when, when did that passion emerge in you? When did I fall in love with science fiction? Oh, that is the first question. time. Let's say the first time. Because I have, time. I have this. Yeah, because I have this question. Um, like I ask DJs a lot, or certain DJs. It's like, when is the first time you fell in love with house music? Because I love house music, and so when's the first time? Because you keep falling in love with it again. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So when was the first time you fell in love with science fiction? I think it was watching reruns of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. I I was gonna guess. <laughs> I know it sounds so cheesy. I'm saying that's everybody's, but it was like seeing Captain Kirk be on all these different planets. <laughs> Captain Kirk is so problematic, but I was young, so I, I didn't know that yet. Seeing you as the comms operator and like with her cute outfit and like, you know, communication systems open um, and just seeing like that exploration um, and seeing the show as like a commentary for our current society, there was one planet that the Star Trek team goes on and they're like literally two people on this planet. And one is black, the right side and white on the, and then vice versa. And like, it's like the only two of them left. And they're like literally trying to kill each other. And it's like, no, because like the guy who's black on the left side, he's a liar and a cheat. And, da, da, da. and it's the, the other guy saying the same thing. And it's the Star Trek crew is like, it actually took them a second to realize like they're two quote, quote unquote different races. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they didn't register the side. <laughs> it took a second. It's like, oh, y'all are both black on one side, white on the other. And they're like, no, we're different. You're like, oh. Okay. 
Um, you know, and you know, and it's just so that was like I was like, you know, there are cultural differences, but it's just like, do we see it? Like, how to respond to that? Do we make that a point of division and violence and war, or do we make that a point of celebration? So I think Star Trek allowed me to ask very big questions that sometimes in my day to day it's hard to do. And then I think in college, even though my major was psychology, I love the idea of using technology to create new opportunities, particularly for entrepreneurship, for black and brown people. So that kind of is what inspired me to do Peace Corps, be a small business volunteer. And how do we like use the internet or eBay to like get better prices? I was, I was volunteering with the cooperative of basket weavers to like get them better prices. And so there's a big difference between getting a basket and selling it to like the local person for a dollar basket versus selling it on eBay for $50 a basket, right? So yeah, technology played a big role in that. And I kind of also understood my role in the system. So like I was historically, I have not been a developer and created the technology, but it's really like if the technology is out there, where's the technology that we can use it? today. And so like that role, like identifying the technology and how it can be used is usually how to operate it. So that's how I operated in Sister Cinema. That's how I operate in Sister Sci-Fi. Like there are lots of different ways that I can sell books. But for me, because I'm looking at the intersection of technology and scalability, Sister Sci-Fi is primarily located in cyberspace. We do a lot of social media commerce, which is again, very scalable. We, unlike other bookstores, we really lean in heavily on yeah. audiobooks and ebooks. I have to figure out my ebook strategy, but because it's scalable, it's tech first. So, yeah, a lot of virtual events and it helped during COVID, like during such a place because the whole world was doing virtual events, but it just aligned to like how I approach the world and also the strategy map that I was creating for Sister Cinema. Sorry, Sister Sci Fi. Yes. Right, 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 right. I like that you kind of talked a little bit more about your background and going and working with small businesses in the Peace Corps and in that experience. And so just going back to our Ghanaian roots, what kind of role would you say that your parents played in kind of influencing? Like, were they entrepreneurial? How did you, how did you get this hustle in you? Because I know we know we have a lot of parents that are like, oh, do you know, when you're here, everyone has like thousand side hustles. It's, it's, but people say Jamaicans have side hustles. Every and most Africans have a lot of side hustles. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So, how did what role did your parents play in all of that? And how have they continued to inspire you or be a part of your business storyline and your movements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a great question. My parents are not entrepreneurs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Guineans, it's definitely hustle culture, and we definitely put, have our hands in lots of pods. But when I think about entrepreneur after, I tend to think of Nigerians. Yeah, Guineans. And let me know if like you're expert, like we love education. So that's that's definitely how my parents helped me. It was like, you'll get all the education. If if I said anything it was related to study, they're like, Yes, you have all the grace, all the latitude, all the resources, what you need, right? Kenyans are some traveling people. We love to travel, <laughs> right? We are like all over the world because if there's an opportunity to travel, I can get it's on that plane. So yeah, and then there's like this culture of, and let me know if you can think of a better word for it, welcomeness and collaboration, right? You know, I don't, I don't speak any indigenous Ghanaian languages, but like I do know the word guava, right? Which is everywhere. Like, and it's how we approach each other as Ghanaians. It's how we approach foreigners. It's how we move in the world. It, and I... That's something I, from my experience, right? And I think that incorporates how I work as a business owner. Um, and that's something that my parents instilled in me. So they weren't, I mean, if I, my parents had a choice, I, I'd stay working at a big corporation. But I think they gave me the tools where the exploration of entrepreneurship in terms of education and so forth was a possibility. Um, so that's how, yeah. I mean, what was your experience with your parents? Those, those are my parents and how much extrapolated culture, but yeah, I would say that my mom became more of a, a hustler 
when she decided she wanted to be in the property game. So my parents, they, yeah, they worked, had their single jobs, single careers. They did what they did. While I was growing up, and this is where my real estate background comes in and why I still do do real estate, is they had rental properties. So we would on weekends, you going around to the rental properties, doing the yard, you know, we were prop, we were property managing our, our rental properties. So when my parents divorced, that stopped for a while. And then my mother started to become more interested in stuff in Ghana. And so she was, and you know, Ghana's cash. You don't have payments to, you know, you get a mortgage in the U.S., but Ghana's cash. So this is when she became, I want to say, the workaholic that she, I mean, she just, she truly loves her her work, but she works a lot or and still works a lot and doesn't have to, but she loves money. I think that's another thing. (laughs) I love money. (laughs) And, you know, I love my mother to death and she's done so well for us. And and definitely I would agree with you on the tools. Like our, my parents definitely gave me the tools by emphasizing education and supporting, you know, whatever, you know, activity that I was interested in. I did get a little bit of the pressure to be a scientist. So that's why I'm an engineer. Not that I'm mad about it. I'm, I'm, I feel Folks, we have our undergrad institution in common. So, <laughs> so we both went to Stanford, not at the same time. We, we, I guess we just kind of crossed each other or tell it, but abutted each other, bookended each other kind of thing. And I went to Stanford not knowing that I was going to major in engineering. And I got yeah. there and that's, that was the closest thing to what I felt was going to be a business like economics was one or it was industrial engineering. And so that's where I went into engineering and I'm so happy and grateful for it because at my core, I'm a problem solver. And so I think we're also problem solvers, right? So we we have that in our, our ethic, like, okay, how do we solve this problem? And how do we, you know, make that move to the next level? So so I would say that circumstance creates the hustle because I think that also happened for a number of my mom's friends. So Similarly, there is this welcoming. So every Ghanaian that came to Colorado was welcomed by the bandwagon. So that we had this full on community that was like, hey, welcome. And then they would be the ambassadors to teach people. Like we had my dad's, all my dad's colleagues or whatever, learned how to eat Ghanaian food and all that stuff. So, and then at work, so the jollof rice was what my mom always took. So yeah, so I would, I would agree with you on that. And I find increasingly as we've gotten just more capitalistic, I think that there's just, and maybe it's the bling culture. I don't know what it is, but there's just more people who are doing the hustle, like really hustling to like having multiple hustles. And I also kind of think it is also the difference of how you migrated to the U.S. Like my parents came for education. Like my dad had a scholarship. So he was tracked into work, then career. And so he was, you know, set in that regard. But those that come that aren't necessarily going straight for in school, they also have a different way that they, that they move in, and I guess in any country, you know? So, so I think this is an interesting time to talk about global speaks. So we're talking a little bit about our parents or, and where we've, where we've been. So this is where I ask you to share a word, a phrase or a saying that is, <laughs> that is a part of your, a, <laughs> part of your local experience. So, I'm something that you hear. We would just want to know what you hear. What would you call your global speak and why or how do you come to value it as that? A lot of words come to mind, but they feel like so hackneyed and cliched. So I'm sitting with that. But I think I'll I'll go to one of the principles for Sister Sci-Fi, which is Ujima. Ujima, that was a dorm when you were at Stanford too, right? Yes, yes. I lived in Ujima my junior year. Yeah, I lived there my freshman year. Which was like it was it was such a hustle. I was like, that was the door that I wanted to put it on my my form and like what do you want? I'm like, I don't know what you because that's why I was like pro for a weekend. I was like, I just I don't I don't know about the rest of the university, but Ujima, I'm definitely signing up. And they're like, Yeah, we don't really have any spots. So we'll see what we can do. And I was like, What? And then like somebody ended up like being someplace else and I ended up getting into Uji. It just made me super happy. Oh, okay. So so and you had a, the freshman all had roommates. So you had a roommate and okay. Were you, were you on yeah. the first floor? Were you on the all girls wing? There was the all girls that was to the right, I think. And then all guys that was above them. And then there was the, the upperclassmen. So freshmen had their two wings and then they had the, the upperclassmen. So my junior year, I lived right above the back door. So, oh, and you probably had a single. No, I had I had the biggest room. Like, so I think this was the biggest room, and we had a sink. 
I don't think every room had a sink. No, so, no. Yeah, we no. had, we, our, our room was dope. I have to say it was dope. And we was like the hangout, like pre-party. <laughs> we faced the lake and it was the, it was the spy room. Like we would, we would look out the, you know, we'd be looking down at people having late night dates. Everyone's creeping. <laughs> But yeah, it was a fun room. So no, it was a big double. Yeah. And it had a sink. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So my, yeah, it was definitely a freshman room on the first floor on the all girls wing. There was, there was no, it was like my roommate's bed, my bed, the desk. It was, there was, there was no hanging out. It was like nothing. So, but we were close. We were close to the communal bathroom. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, so that was um, it was college. Do they call it the crossroads when you were when you were there, like by the lounge? And when you're describing it, I was like, one, I don't think I realized that there was all girls' room, all the first girls' room. First, so I was like, where was I? But so sometimes I was like, where was I? I don't think so, but it's a possibility that they did, and I just it went over my head. So, um, but yeah, but yeah, I loved. It's an experience. Like I think. It was definitely an integral part of my freshman year because we ate lunch there every, pretty much every day. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Like, because the food got good at Stanford my sophomore year. So you could go to other places and have good food, but the food was equally terrible in Wilbur as it was in Uj. <laughs> so it's like, let's just go because it was all my children hours. So lunchtime was all my children hours. So we go oh, watch no. all my children and then I go have track practice. So that was uh that was a you were, you were an athlete at Stanford? I was, yeah. I'm like, how did you have time for bless your heart? You were much more than me because I was just stressed. <laughs> and I, I did not, yeah, I was like, I was just stressed. Good for you. And I was not an athlete, so I don't I don't know. I, I don't know how you did it. The person I dated at Stanford was on the wrestling team and I was like, I don't know how you do it because I'm just stressed. I mean, for me, it was, I was always an athlete through high school. And so it was just the discipline of time management. I had enough social, but there was a time management thing that I, that I just had in me. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good for you. I don't know. Anyway. So, yeah. So, so Ujama. So Ujama. Yeah. Yeah. So going back. So, yes, it was, it was, it was a dorm in Sanford, but for me, the principal is the principal of Kwanzaa that collected economics. And so economic success for me is valued when it's tied to the economic success of my peers. And it's a very symbiotic relationship. So that is the word that I'll offer in terms of my local speech. I don't know if it really counts, but it's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. And it, you know that word, it still reminds me of Oakland. So I feel like it that is part like a spirit of Oakland kind of thing. So yeah, I like that. Ujama. That's going to do it for part one of my conversation with Isis Asari of Sister Sci-Fi. Please do join us next week when Isis tells us about how Sister Sci-Fi came to be, as well as a lot more about science fiction and just a lot of fun. I had a great time with this interview. So as always, please do like, share, subscribe, tell a friend. You can catch us with new episodes on Tuesdays at GlocalCitizensPod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, sharing is caring. So when you share or leave us a review, it helps other people find good content on the internet. So until next time, bye for now.